Hi, my name is Alex Rivera and welcome to Oasis Church. I'm so glad you've joined our online experience today. You know, no matter where you are right now, this online experience is here to provide you with a church family. That means we don't want you to just watch the service. We wanna pray with you, we wanna encourage you, we wanna help to be a drop of hope in your life. But the only way we can do that is if you let us know you're here. The way you can let us know you're watching is by filling out the Connect card or by dropping us an email at online at visitoasis.org. Now, if you live in the South Florida area, I wanna encourage you to visit our local campus here in Pembroke Pines. For more information about our location and times, you can go on our website, www.visitoasis.org and click on the time and location button. But stick through the end of service because we got some more information about how you can get connected and how we'd like to help serve you and help you continue this journey with God. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's experience. God bless you. Happy Easter, Oasis. Oh my goodness. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Oh, that's a whole lot better. That sounds better. It's great to have you today on this incredible, beautiful weather day. But even better is his worst day was our best day. And that's what we're talking about. That is what our volunteers and our staff and team have just shared with you in these last 12 minutes how the New Testament projected the suffering Christ that was crucified, was buried, and rose again for you and me to give us hope. And yet... That gospel New Testament story was not the first time Easter was talked about. I'm going to take us to a passage of scripture today I've never used on Easter before. And probably 99% of the churches today will not use because everyone will be in the New Testament. Understandable. But did you know that Easter was first talked about in the Old Testament. And that's what we're going to look at today. Now, here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. I'm going to give you a lot of New Testament passages in the New Testament, but we're not going to read them for sake of time. I want you to go and I want you to compare what I tell you and what we read in Isaiah 52 and 53 with what's also in the New Testament, in the Gospels about today, this weekend, Easter We are going to actually look at Easter in the Old Testament. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this should just strengthen your faith. To know that that thread has gone from 700 years written about what Jesus would do even before he did it. That's that's amazing. If you're seeking the truth, this should just help even draw you closer to him, the one we celebrate at Easter, knowing that a prophet Isaiah literally prophesied and told us what he would do to some of the very words, actually, 700 years prior. And even agnostic, looking at the prophecies here in the Old Testament of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the resurrection should also begin to see your thoughts bridged from your doubts to belief when you think that there has been prophecy given 700 years prior to it ever happening. The prophet Isaiah never saw Jesus. He never knew the people of that day, obviously 700 years apart, and yet he prophesied and he told what would happen. Do you know what the odds of that are? It is estimated that anywhere between 250 and 450 prophecies of the Old Testament was written that were fulfilled in the New Testament. 300 and something by Jesus. We'll take the conservative side of it 
and say 200 and something prophecies were fulfilled. Now these are men that didn't know each other writing over hundreds of years from different continents, different languages, different backgrounds and all came together in one story that we call the Bible. It is not an Old and a New Testament separate. They are two in one with one story and the one story is God's love for his people and his Thirst to redeem us. Now don't let redemption, that word, trip you up. It's just simply like if you were to have a reward given to you, you redeem it if it's in a coupon. Someone gives you a gift card. You go to the store and you redeem it. You cash it in. That is what Jesus, when he died on the cross and was buried and rose again, he cashed That redemption certificate for us. All we have to do is accept it. But it wasn't just the New Testament. It was the Old Testament that this story is told. A professor, Peter Stoner of Pasadena City College in California. He's a mathematics professor that did all kinds of studies on the odds of Jesus fulfilling just eight prophecies, just eight. Now remember, it's anywhere from 250 to 400 that he fulfilled that were prophesied by the prophets in the Old Testament. But this professor said if he just fulfilled eight prophecies, this is what it would look like. You blanket the area of the size of Texas. You know how big Texas is, it's huge. Thousands of square miles. With silver dollars, two feet deep. Thousands of square miles, silver dollars, two feet deep. You blanket the state of Texas with that. And then you choose one silver dollar, one, out of all of those. You hide it somewhere in that vast area. And then thirdly, you take a blindfolded person and you ask him to select the exact dollar you marked out of two feet of silver dollars blanketing the state of Texas. And that would be the odds of Jesus fulfilling just eight of the hundreds of prophecies. He said that those odds would be for a blindfolded person to find one silver dollar marked in the size of the state of Texas, two feet tall of silver dollars, it would be the chances of one in 100 quadrillion. I don't even know what that means. I know the odds for winning the lottery are even less than that. And they're not very good. It is amazing to see what was told. And some would say, but that was a writings of a man. And, and that, how do you know that wasn't made up? Well, history and archaeology continues over and over, even recently, to prove the things that Jesus and others spoke of and did today. And even fulfilled from what was given hundreds of years before. Ironically... We were just in Israel. We visited the shrine of the book, which houses the entire handwritten original of Isaiah's prophecies. Now, this is a replica they have on display there. The entire book, except for just a few chapters that were ripped up and they couldn't put together. It was found in 1948 in a cave, the Qumran Caves, you may have heard about, overlooking the Dead Sea. When we went there in February, we got to look down in the caves there to where this shepherd boy found hundreds of scrolls and Isaiah's was one of them. And it had been preserved for some close to 2,700 years, the prophecies of Jesus Christ. See, the resurrection 
of the Messiah in the Old Testament gives us hope today. Sometimes many of us, we, we think the Old Testament isn't relevant because it was the law. And Jesus came and did away with the law. He, get, he did away with the law and he put us under grace. But he also connected what had been foretold. This Old Testament, Easter, is as relevant Today, as it was 2,000 years ago and even 2,700 years ago when the prophet saw it before it ever happened. And it gives us hope because it says that he was the light. He was the resurrection. He rose even then. Look at Isaiah chapter 52 with me. In Isaiah chapter 52, in verse 13, it says, See, my servant will act wisely he will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted just as there were many who were appalled at him and his appearance was so disfigured beyond any man and his form marred beyond human likeness so will he sprinkle many nations and the kings will shut their mouths because of him for what they were not told they will see and what they have not heard they will understand it begins and it continues to go into chapter 53 describing a suffering Savior, a Messiah, the Messiah that the Jewish people had been promised and they were looking forward to. The Messiah that would take their brokenness and make it right, their sins and forgive them. Many of the Jews looked for that Messiah to be the anointed and the chosen one, but they were looking for him to be royalty. They were looking for him to come and conquer the earth and bring in a political kingdom and make everything right. They missed it. He, he didn't look anything like what they thought. And that's why many Jews did not believe then and they don't believe now many times. But sometimes people want to say Christianity and Judaism are two separate religions. No, we are the root of Judaism. You cannot separate us. The only difference comes is that many of the Jews today do not accept Jesus as the Messiah, but it's right here. God had given it to them, this picture, right in Isaiah, just as he did in the Gospels. When we read about him rising from life after being beaten and killed in Isaiah, you can go to the New Testament scriptures, look it up, Matthew 27, 28, the crucifixion, resurrection, and in verse 6, in the garden that day, verse 6, the angel told Mary and Mary that were the first ones to come to check on the body of Jesus that had been laid in the grave. That by the way, verse 10 prophesied in Isaiah 53 that he would be laid in a rich man's tomb. In Matthew, the rich man was Joseph of Arimathea. And when they went to look for him, the angel said, he is not here, he is risen. On his worst day, it became our best day. Aside from the grind, aside from the heaviness, I've read some heavy cards this morning already from people that are going through so much. I want to tell you that the prophecy of Isaiah 2,700 years ago and the death of Christ 2,000 years ago give you and I reason to celebrate and have hope today because he was the only one that could bring this hope and he did it and it was prophesied. And the reason that the Diaz family that you saw in that story could say, even though we're dealing with cancer and we're dealing with insurmountable problems, we can trust him. He has taken our brokenness and he has healed us. That's what the resurrection of the Old Testament Messiah does for every one of us. Now in John, the Gospels, it said, chapter 12, the Jews did not believe. Many Gentiles did not believe because they were looking for a different person. But it was right there before them. The prophet, their prophet, had showed them. And in the New Testament, he became... Not only the Jewish Messiah, but our Messiah, those of us that aren't Jews. And in Romans chapter 10 and verse 16, that while many of his own people did not receive him, it said that in Romans chapter 15, many Gentiles did receive him. Because see, the Bible and the Gospels took from the law for the Jews in the Old Testament 
and they included all the rest of us and the Bible says we were grafted in. And so each of us had that same opportunity to celebrate and to have the Savior when we trust him as that prophetic Messiah that came that hundreds of years before the prophet Isaiah had told us about. But why Jesus? Why, why did he have to suffer? Well, we see that in verses 1 through 8. He simply needed to suffer as our substitute. Look with me there, if you would, as we continue in Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? Verse 1, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, our sins, our failures. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. These same verses are given in the Gospels. These same words, 700 years later, Jesus fulfilled. Jesus himself even prophesied he would rise in three days. Do you know there are places in the Old Testament that talks about him rising in three days? It is amazing what the Old and New Testament connect here that on his worst day, while he was crushed, he was the substitute for us. His crushing, his punishment on the cross brought us peace. It's what healed us. Verse 6, we are like sheep that have gone astray. Each of us have turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and his sheep before her shearers is silent, and so he did not open his mouth. Verse 8, for he was cut off from the land of the living. He was crucified. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked. Remember, he was crucified between two thieves transgressors he was assigned the grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death though he had done no violence we stood in one of the two places most likely that he was crucified steps away on a crucifixion hill next to it with a garden with a rich man's tomb we stood there in February several trips there's only two places that are known that have been found that would meet the criteria and one of them is the garden there in Jerusalem we stood before that tomb we looked into that rich man's tomb it was not an ordinary typical tomb in a garden next to the crucifixion spot we actually got to experience when we were in Israel and we'll go back next year to be able to experience exactly what Isaiah had said 2700 years prior and that Jesus had done for us he isn't there because he's risen because he took upon us and fulfilled what was said. Matthew 8, 17. Write it down. Go look it up. Luke chapter 22, verses 37. Now sometimes we want to, matter of fact, Acts 8, we'll turn there at the very end in a few moments. Acts 8 also talks about how as an innocent lamb, he was sacrificed for our sins. He was the scapegoat. For us. See, it wasn't only God's people that made a lot of mistakes. Look at the Old Testament. Man, the Jews, they were messing up constantly. 
They were turning their back. They were following false gods. They, they just messed up constantly, and God just had to keep whipping them. But he loved them so much, he, he couldn't stop taking care of them, and so he sent them a Messiah. But the thing is, before we think as Gentiles we're any better, man, we, we have sinned just as much. Matter of fact, in Romans, the book in the New Testament, chapter 3, verse 10, it says, there's nobody righteous that's a human. Verse 23, it says, we've all sinned. And we've all come short of God's holiness. And that sin separates us from God. And it will for eternity if there wasn't a substitute. There had to be a substitute. Now, let's go back to the Old Testament where Isaiah is prophesying from. In the Old Testament, under the law... How were their sins covered? They would take the most innocent, pure, perfect lamb that they could find. They would take it into the tabernacle of the temple. They would sacrifice it. That lamb would shed the blood for the sins of the Jewish people. When Jesus came... He came to do away with the law. Jesus, Isaiah 53, we just read it. The New Testament, Acts chapter 8, Luke chapter 22, said that he became the perfect lamb, sacrificed for the sins of the world. He, on the cross, became our substitute. Nothing we can do. I don't care how good you are. You may be good, much better than the person sitting next to you. Don't look at them. You may be better than your spouse. You may be better than your brothers and sisters. You may be better than everyone in this room. But you've still sinned. And the Bible says we've all sinned and we've all fallen short. And so it had to have an unblemished lamb. And Isaiah called that lamb the suffering savior. And then in all the gospels, it took the lamb and called him Jesus. And Jesus laid down his life voluntarily so that we could have life. On his worst day, he gave us our best day. He gave us hope for eternal life. As that innocent lamb of God. And after he died, verse 11, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear our iniquities. Verse 12, the second half, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered among the, among the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's us. And in the New Testament, that's what he did. Thirdly, he, his death, became our bridge back to God. Between our sin and between a holy God, there's a big chasm nothing could bridge it except an innocent lamb and you'll see on this this graphic that we're providing for you this is the bridge that Jesus became not only for the Jews but for each of us it is coming up I promise it's there yes thank you we are separated from God the only thing that can reunite us is the cross. The fulfilled prophecy of Isaiah 700 years before Jesus actually came and as a lamb was put on the cross. And from the cross they took him down and the cross as they laid him in the grave became the bridge between our sin and a holy God. It is the only one, he is the only one that can bridge that back as Isaiah 53 verses 9 through 12 that we just read tells us it was through his suffering on the cross, his death as the Bible says, 
his burial in a rich man's tomb, as was prophesied, and his resurrection to newness of life, as even the Old Testament prophesied on the third day, allowed us, not because of anything that we have done, because of what he did, by laying down his life, he made a bridge that we could cross to a holy God. And that's why the book of Romans in the New Testament says that he gave us the gift of eternal life. There is someone in here today you need to have that gift. You need to have the brokenness, the shame, the guilt, the failures buried. You need to have the celebration of new life that Jesus brought. And he's the only one that can do it. Oasis doesn't offer that. None of us can offer that because we're all sinners, the Bible said. Saved only by the grace of the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the earth. I want us to look at one final passage, and that's in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 8, we will see once again the connection of the Old Testament words of the prophet Isaiah in the New Testament. In chapter 8, we see one of the early followers and disciples of Christ, Philip, was going down toward Gaza. Today we know of Gaza as being part of the conflict, the Palestinian and the Israeli conflict. But in that same area, as you look on this chart, people would come to Jerusalem for thousands of years to worship. The Jews would come from all over to worship in Jerusalem. An Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 came from Ethiopia. He was probably, they think, the queen's treasure. He was very rich because he rode in a chariot. And he had gone up to Jerusalem as they would do periodically for different festivals to worship God with the Jews. I don't know if he was Jewish, but that's what he was worshiping. It doesn't, and he was going back toward Egypt and Ethiopia, just south of Israel. And he was going the Gaza road and he was stopped and he was reading none other than the scroll of the prophet Isaiah 53. 700 years after it was written, after Jesus had come, he was reading that same passage that we just read, but let's look at it here in verse 32 of Acts chapter 8. And this rich Ethiopian leader, assistant to Candace the queen, he had to be rich. He had to be something special because remember, they didn't have printing presses. There was only so many copies of the prophet Isaiah's scroll, his words. We don't know how many, but there, there couldn't be many and only rich people could have them. And he had the scroll and back in the day, they would read because not everybody had a Bible like we do. They would read it in public so everyone could hear, but only rich could own something so precious. And so he was reading and he was reading out loud and Philip saw that and he comes up to him and it says in verse 32, the eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. See if this sounds familiar. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before the shearer is silent and he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants for his life was taken from the earth. Verse 28, it says that he was reading this passage from the prophet of Isaiah. The connection between the Old Testament prophecy and a New Testament person. 
He didn't understand what he was reading. Philip comes up and he asks Philip, tell me, please, verse 34, who's the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And Philip began with that very passage of scripture. Remember, Philip had been with Jesus. And he told him the good news about Jesus. The rest of the passage goes on to say he received Jesus Christ and what every new believer should do and did back then as soon as they received Christ, the picture of baptism, of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He said, let's find some water. I want to be baptized. And in verse 39, as soon as he received the good news of Jesus that had been prophesied 700 years before, that Philip had actually seen the prophecy fulfilled in the life of Jesus and his death and his resurrection, he received the good news and it said in verse 39, he rejoiced. There's someone here today that's broken, that you've been running, you've been hiding, you, you, you cannot see the light. I'm telling you, the light is right before you. And on his worst day, he gave his life so we could have light and life and hope for eternal life. And that is the story of Easter from the New, Old Testament to the New Testament. Could we have our hearts bowed and our eyes closed? This morning, someone needs to have that same hope that the rich man on the chariot received from Isaiah 53 and an eyewitness of the New Testament Jesus fulfilling the crucifixion and resurrection. Someone needs to go away from this place today as the Ethiopian eunuch did in verse 39 rejoicing because you have found a better way. You have found hope and the only place is Jesus. You have found eternal life in the only place is Jesus. The amazing thing about the story of the Ethiopian eunuch is even though he was rich and even though he didn't know Philip, when he heard the story of the good news of Jesus fulfilled from the prophet Isaiah's words that he was in the chariot reading, he immediately was all in. He didn't go ask permission from the queen. He didn't hesitate. He didn't procrastinate. And that's my question to you. How about you? Are you all in today? Are you ready to put your faith and trust? Because it is the choice of every one of us what we will do with Jesus. If you've never prayed the prayer that the Bible gives us in that book of Romans in the New Testament to receive Jesus Christ and eternal life and the gift that Romans chapter 6 gives us, You've never received him. I'm going to invite you to pray that prayer with me this morning. From Romans chapter 10, it's a simple prayer. The Bible says we believe in our heart and we confess him with our mouth. And if you have never done that, I'm going to ask you right there in your seat. You don't have to yell it. You don't have to say it loud. God will hear. More importantly, he will see your heart. You can whisper it. You can mouth it. But if you believe in that Jesus of Isaiah 53, the Jesus of the Gospels that still transforms lives today, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me right now. And you pray it not to me, but you pray it to Jesus. Jesus, my life is broken. I recognize that I'm a sinner. And I need you. I believe that you came to live, to die, and that you were raised from the dead in order to rescue me. Forgive me today of my sins. Forgive me of my selfish ways. Today I put my trust in you. Today, Jesus I want you to be my Lord and I want to follow you. If you prayed that prayer with me this morning, I'd like to rejoice with you as Philip did the Ethiopian eunuch in your receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. If you prayed that prayer with me, would you just slip up your hand? No one else is looking. Just slip up your hand. Let me see it. I see your hand, ma'am. Sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. 
I see your hand all the way back in the community cafe. I see those hands. Keep them up. Would you keep them up? Our ushers, they're the only ones looking. They're going to bring you a card to fill out. And if you'd like more information, we want to go beyond just this service. We want to get, send you and get you more information. Just fill that out and you can turn it in at the end of the service. He gives us so much hope. That's why he's given us the church is to be here for each other, to encourage each other. And if you're here today and you have already received Christ, whether you just did it right then or you did it 50 years ago or two years ago, I want to challenge you to be just like the Ethiopian eunuch in that as soon as he followed Jesus and believed in the good news of Jesus, it said he was baptized. Next week, we have a very special baptism at the end of every service. You won't need anything except a little information right on your card baptism. If you want to follow the Lord in the good news of what you found today, or even if it was years ago, but you've never followed him, but you see right there in a beautiful picture of what the early believers did as soon as they received Christ, the baptism was the symbol of his death, his burial and resurrection, and they followed him. I want to challenge some of you to follow him next week in that most amazing step of faith that says, I'm all in. I'm all in. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your word to your people in Isaiah, your word to us in the New Testament, that you have grafted us in, that you have loved us all, that you have given hope for all of us, salvation for all of us. I thank you for those that have received you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for checking out this week's message. Do you belong to a church family? If not, I want to invite you to join our community. We have members all around the world. Learn more by filling out our next step form or email online at visitoasis.org. Have a great week.